questions. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, I just want to take a moment to thank you so much for uh, taking time out of your busy schedule to uh, sit with us and get to know Jason Price, who is a candidate for the Western Placer Union School District. Um, and it's my honor and privilege to kind of be the moderator and to ask him some questions. <clears throat> so you can get to know him and uh, you have an educated vote because that's what we want to do. We want to make sure everybody is educated before we go to the polls on November 3rd. Mm -hmm. So um, welcome everybody. And uh, my name is Holly Andreata. I'm on the city council. And, uh, and so, like I said, it's my, my privilege to be here. So, so Jason, hello. How are you tonight? I'm great, Holly. And thanks for doing this, by the way. Like I said, I, I'm sure this is the last thing you want to do this evening is be in another Zoom meeting. But, no, uh, I love this stuff. This is great. This is great. So why don't you go ahead and just start us off by telling us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, no, I'd, I'd be glad to. So um, as Holly said, my name is, is Jason Price. I live uh, in the Foskett Ranch area of Lincoln, and, and we have my wife and I who's on the call. Hi, hon. Uh, <laughs> we've lived in the Foskett Ranch area since 2008. We have, uh, we've raised four kids here, uh, three of which have already gone through the school district and are in college now, and then a senior that starts this year. Um, you know, I, th there's, there's a lot of probably um, seasons in my life. A lot of those, I think, help shape the fact that I'm, I'm pretty agile. There's a lot of different problems throughout my life I've been asked to solve. I've, I've worked as a, um, as a first responder uh, and a paramedic and a firefighter. Uh, I did a lot of training uh, in that specific space. So, you know, training resuscitation and technical rescue and hazardous materials, and then uh, started a, my own firm for a while that was sort of a niche version of, if you can picture like first in CPR, but for paramedics, nurses, physicians, and so forth, um, I did sort of a boutique style. They have to take classes every two years to recertify these skills. So I decided to serve a nice lunch and put them in a leather chair and, you know, increase the margin of scotch uh, so that it covered the expenses, but they loved the idea of having a more relaxed and more sort of collegial environment where they could talk through it. And it wasn't so, um, the, the classes were relatively militant. So I tried to, you know, bring an entrepreneurial spin to that and, and make it more of a, a fun experience. Um, so sold that firm and joined a much larger firm and, you know, took an executive role there for, for a handful of years, grew that uh, from quite a bit before moving into technology, which is where I, I work now. So um, okay, as well, far as kind of like, uh, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say, why don't you tell us your, what the technology job that you were, are you doing now? What is that? Yeah, it's, this is an interesting season uh, for, for us, but essentially what my firm does, it's called Select Communications. And ideally we, we work with organizations that are trying to find the right technology move to get them off of, you know, premise type hardware solutions and, you know, dated internet connectivity hardware and move more into the cloud. So if they're looking to do maybe cloud file storage or maybe they're trying to leverage cloud communications like everyone is, maybe they're trying to replace an aging PBX phone system or maybe they're trying to bring someone in to do what's called pen testing for cybersecurity, which is ideally a great job for a young, this is like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna find high school kids that want to hack uh, professional uh, networks for a living because there's an exponential salary that you can make as, as a cyber pen tester. So we do those types of services and my job really it's customer facing. So I'm dealing with, um, you know, a lot of times it's like a CFO in some cases, but a lot of chief technology officers, um, VPs of technology, directors of IT that are really trying to roadmap um, away from where they are to where they hope to be. Um, a lot of that has to do with cost control. A lot of it has to do with security. So we're doing a ton of those things. And then obviously since March of this year, it's been an all out blitz to try and get healthcare organizations, which are usually pretty technologically uh, concerned about security and, and premise data hosting. So now they're, they're having, they're being forced into cloud communication. So we've been trying to, trying to help a lot of different hospitals, some even in Los Angeles to sort of prepare for all the different ways that they're being pulled these days. Wow, well, it's, you, it sounds like you have a lot of experience in different areas. So my next question to you is, why did you choose to run for school board? So why school board and why now? I think that people would really like to hear that. So I, I'm, a, I'm a leadership person. I, I appreciate good leadership. I, uh, I work hard to sort of hone leadership skills in myself and anybody who holds it still. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm a, 
I would call myself a servant leader in a sense that I like to look for opportunities to bring a skill set and see if we can move things forward in a way that serves uh, the community. And I've done some community service type projects. I've worked with the city and with some committees and whatnot, but um, I really feel like our, our, our kids are the most deserving of people that, you know, really just want to be as, you know, helpful and as supportive as they possibly can. I just couldn't think of a better place to give the spare time I don't have uh, than, than, than to kids. I feel like they're at that at pivotal moment in their life. And again, I'm watching things in the professional world that are changing in a way that I don't think our school system as a whole is really prepared to, uh, to adapt to. And I have to be careful because I know you are a teacher and I don't, I don't want to come off insulting. I think the system in and of itself is really built on a, on a very old framework that is not capable of keeping up with the pace of technology and the changes there. So my focus really is to try and make sure that as best we can, we give kids as much preparation as we can for the job market they're heading into and kind of this new economy that they're, you know, will likely be joining. And it's not going to look anything like the economy. I think that we all left high school and moved into, I think it's a very different season ahead of us. Right. Well, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to change my order of questions really quickly because Please. you just, what you just said uh, brought something to my mind that I feel very strongly about. Um, what is your feeling about uh, bringing back um, trades in the school? Now I know Lincoln high school has kept a lot of theirs. God bless Lincoln high school. Like they have kept most of their trades, but being in education and my husband is in education. We have seen, this whole push, like every kid has to go to college, which college is important, like, of course, mm -hmm. right? Um, but not every kid wants to go to college. And we are suffering with people who are in the trade. So like, how do you feel about that? So first I'll say there is a, there is a population of kid that is wired for executive track um, type leadership. There, there's, a, there's a kid that is a scientist, uh, is, a, is a, a nurse or physician and, and fits very cleanly into a track that moves them right through college and into that profession. Right. Um, and, and I would never discredit that track. I think that, cra that track is essential. <laughs> Where I think I agree with you here is the sense that we used to um, just say, hey, let's go to college, figure yourself out. You know, like just do you, uh, you know, like just experience life and find out where your likes and dislikes are. And you know, if that didn't cost 75 or 80 grand, um, I would still be all for it. And, and I worry a lot about how much debt our kids have to accumulate mm -hmm. so that they can get a college degree. And if you really think about higher education a decade or so ago, was really the, the, the cornerstone was, hey, your professor is gonna have access to re, like the most current and most thorough and vetted information out there. And we are now in an information age. We're in an information technology where I would argue you can actually find more relevant information. I mean, it might not be accurate depending on who you ask, but it's out there and it's free and it's unlimited and it's growing at an exponential rate. We are saving and storing and cataloging more data now than we've ever even thought we could. So I question the real validity of needing an organized college approach nowadays to get sort of the same throughput. Um, so for that reason, I would say there are, Expen there, there's fantastic job opportunities for people that learn a trade, learn a craft. Mm -hmm. And I am one of those people. Like when I graduated, I wasn't even out of high school yet before I went and got an EMT certificate. Oh. And, and that, that was free. I got that at junior college. And then when I graduated high school, I went through paramedic school. And when I was done with that, it was a vocational program. And when I was done with that, um, I had a 65 or $70,000 earning income and I had spent $2,200 on my own education. It was done in a year. Um, it, now, since then, I've tried to articulate to, that to somebody who, you know, now is an executive when I'm talking to others, they're kind of like, so where'd you go to college? And that's a longer answer than I think some would prefer. But I also will tell you that my life has allowed me to see and experience certain things about society, um, just, you know, my own health and well-being and so on and so forth, just from learning so much about um, not just being a paramedic, but how to teach those different types of skills, that I would say if we could teach students better how to manage the seasons of their life, you could incorporate, hey, listen, if you're not sure what you want to do, rather than go off and, you know, sign up for a four-year university, perhaps you do a trade and you spend a season getting really good at something that somebody will buy from you no matter where you are, no matter what, you know, it's a skill that's needed. You're an electrician, you're a plumber, you're a networking um, person, you're, a, you know, a computer scientist. 
some of these things you can do in VOC programs, and that doesn't preclude you later on from getting a degree when you know more about where you want to go. And I think that's, I want to see people think of a vocation and a trade and a craft as an equitable thing to a, to a college degree that wasn't meant to go any specific direction. If you know what I mean, it's that person that goes and gets a bachelor's in, in communications, graduates from college and goes, oh my gosh, there's like a hundred other people trying to get this one job and it's gonna pay 60,000 a year. Um, that to me is, is frustrating for a kid. It would be frustrating for me. Um, and then here come, you know, here come the, the loan payments. So I am a huge advocate for vocation and I think it should be presented to students in a way that they capture college credits as they progress with the idea that, you know, do this until your knees start to hurt. And then here's an off ramp to something that's a little bit less impactful on your body or teach them how to start their own business because yeah. that's an unbelievable way to sort of, you know, pay your own way through life. Perfect. So, um, so if you, if you are elected, um, what is your understanding of the board's responsibility? Yeah. <laughs> So I, and I can see Chris here, so hopefully I got this one right. Um, ideally, uh, Western Plaster is a board of five, um, three that specifically uh, represent the citizens of and students and teachers of Lincoln, and then two from sort of outlying areas that we have schools in as well. And the ma main focus of the school board is really to, to sort of plot the vision that's set by the community, um, by the community's students and parents and, and staff um, to sort of, you know, keep, I would say to bring in the right superintendents and uh, make sure that those superintendents are hiring and managing the right staff so that we get the right people in front of our kids as, as teachers and, and so forth. There's, um, there's advocacy work that's done. There's also a considerable amount of counsel in terms of discipline when things aren't going well and what should be done with teachers that maybe aren't a good fit, um, those types of things. Obviously there's purview of the budget there's uh, a deep understanding of the facilities of the district as well and different sort of schools that are being added or mediated, or I should say maybe um, like remodeled and, and how that all plays in. There's, you know, if and when bonds come up, the, the, the district is also responsible for sort of crafting how that matches. I, I see it as um, you're really sort of the, the educational ombudsman for lack of a better term. You're the person that connects the people to the institution that's spending tax dollars to educate kids. So I would see it very much as a role of making sure those voices are heard. Hi, right, thank you. Um, and anytime anybody has a question, you can put it in the chat and I'll pause and we'll, we'll grab your question. Um, so you kind of already touched a little bit about things that you would like to see happen. Um, what changes do you think the board and, and or the district need, need to make? Um, I mean, I, I think our school district does a great job, but, but we can always do better. So what, what kind of things do you vision, envision of wanting to change um, or, or a different, like you said, casting vision? What, what do you think needs to change? Well, for one, I'd like to see the board a little bit more accessible in a way that's more proactive to the community. So um, they'll all answer the phone. I've called them all. They all pick up the phone. They're very friendly to talk to. I'd like to see a little bit more push communication than pull. Um, I'd like to see a little bit more strategic and roadmap type conversations in a public forum. And, and I know that they, you know, they'll put the agenda on the website, they'll invite people to come in with public comment. But I think bigger than that, you know, more of a stream of information, um, you know, maybe better leveraging social media to discuss the things that are changing, um, you know, maybe more community involvement as it pertains to some of the larger decisions that are, are not just being made, but about to be made. So, that, you know, there was quite a bit of uh, you know, rub, you saw quite a bit of a rub on social media around, you know, uh, Scott's retirement and Carrie's placement. And I feel like there was a lot of planning done there that was done pretty quietly. And it left a lot of parents feeling like they were without a voice. It even left some staff feeling like they were without a voice. And I always say, you know, in leadership, communication is absolutely essential. The more you communicate, the more people understand the vision. Um, so one thing I would definitely want to see is a bit more, um, you know, collaboration with the public and maybe not such a, you know, hey, we, we made that decision because it was the best one. Just trust us, it'll all be fine. Um, the other thing is I think we've got to lead first as it pertains to technology. Um, I'm sensitive to this because I've watched companies for a decade try to pivot from face-to-face -face meetings to online. And I personally have had to transition curriculum 
from face to face to online. And Holly, um, I don't know how you guys are doing it because it is incredibly difficult to take what used to work in a room full of people and make it work in, you know, in, in front of a screen. It's, they're very, very different mediums. And I'd like to see the board embrace that more. You know, the board meetings right now are largely over the phone. And, you know, I think the ask of the teachers is to find a way to collaborate and show their face and see the faces and the board should be doing that as well. So they're gonna catch some, some sort of friction for me on that. Like, hey, I'm all about, we lead from the middle. Like we should be right there with the team getting through whatever this, you know, barrier is. And uh, I, I'm gonna ask for us to, to, to be a, a more representative tip of the spear as opposed to, well, you know, that meeting style is hard for us, but, you know, teachers, you guys are going to have to figure it out. Um, also, as it pertains to, you know, teachers coming back to the classroom, I think there's a lot of teachers that are very nervous about coming back to a classroom full of kids that now, after they've been sort of quarantined for months, are sort of thrust back into this environment where they don't have any control over where this kid was and where their parents were and whether or not they're touching their face. I would imagine some teachers are pretty anxious. I think a lot of those teachers are also part of the, our sensitive community that might be a little bit more susceptible to COVID. Um, I, I think what we, we as the board should also be meeting in person. We should find a way to work within the confines of PPE, like we're asking our teachers to, to get in front of uh, the public, just like they're getting in front of kids and let them know that, hey, we're not asking you to do anything we wouldn't do ourselves. Um, so, so those are a couple of things. The other thing is, I, like I said before, I think we've got maybe unleveraged resources. We have an airport, and, and I want to I talk about how to leverage pilot education as a, as a vocation or a trade that the high school can assist with. I want to find out what other avenues we can pursue with our farm that might involve technology or might involve, you know, partnerships with major universities that, that train. And, and again, I don't know to what extent we've done that already, but those are all questions that I have kind of day one. Good. Wow. Well. That's awesome. Um, so, so having run two campaigns myself, I, I know. Um, I don't know how you did it. <laughs> I know how, how, how you know, <laughs> it's a learning curve and there's a lot that goes into it. So I'm, I'm really interested to hear, and I'm sure everybody else is, what have you done to prepare for this role if you get elected? I mean, you come from a, a first responder background and a business technology mm -hmm. background. Um, and, and you're wanting to step into this role to help lead our, our school district. So what have you done to prepare for this? Well, I've done a lot, and I don't know that I did it intentionally for this role, but um, I find that because I've been uh, near so many different types of workplace challenges, I've had to learn to solve a lot of different problems. Um, like, for instance, when COVID hit, there was a small group of us that were trying to figure out how do we do, you know, what life raft do we have for small businesses that a minute ago, they could make a sandwich and hand it to somebody, now they can't. Um, I actually thrive in situations like that. Um, you know, I started as a, as a paramedic and you can't ask for a more uncontrolled situation than, you know, running a, a, a cardiac arrest in somebody's living room that you've literally just met for the very first time. So I'm, I'm quite adept at taking whatever the problem is, deconstructing it fairly quickly and charting you know, the path of most likely success. And then the skill that I think I've honed over the years, especially since the last couple of years I've been involved with the city leadership program is really now, how do you get people to back that vision um, to change and edit the vision where it needs editing and change and then buy into it. So it moves forward. Um, that's, I think consensus building is probably the skill that I might offer that will be more valuable than all the rest is, Let's not argue about we, what we disagree about. Let's talk about the few things that we have in common and let's build from there and let's look for compromise. So um, I, I, think, I think I bring that. I've also spent, poor Scott Lehman. I mean, I have probably tied that guy up on the phone for at least seven or eight hours. And now it's a, you know, hey, Jason. I mean, it's, I just feel terrible for him. I, I really do. I, you know, it's, and then the same with Carrie. Uh, it, and she sort of emerged that I just have all these questions. Well, what's our relationship like with our label groups? And, you know, what happens if a teacher underperforms? And what happens if, if uh, you know, I mean, I just have a thousand questions. So um, I've really just been trying to soak up every bit of what I can as far as, you know, the, the board's previous decisions and the status of the district and their finances and everything else so that hopefully I don't have to waste the taxpayer's time coming up to speed 
um, and I can sort of hit the ground running. I'll have lots of questions, but I'm a fairly quick study. Um, I'm also going to bring a business perspective that I think is really important in government. I, I just, I think now more than ever, it's really important to have somebody who's very pragmatic, who wants to make sure it's funded, who wants to make sure it's scalable and sustainable, and, and then, you know, move forward with the idea of what key performance metrics do we need to tag to make sure this is, is healthy and working and all those other things. So um, I'm very much a project person and I think that'll help as well. Um, but yeah, I would say those are the big ones. Oh, and I'll also say that I've already done some projects with, uh, with, with at least the high school. Um, um, Amanda Ritalik, who, who heads the CTE Works um, biomedical program, I'm on her advisory board. Wow. And together we put together a CPR training program that's entirely student run. Uh, that's, there is no other program in the United States that's entirely run by students. So she has a team of students that can actually teach CPR to staff and fellow students to meet the mandate in California that's coming to make sure every high school student is trained in CPR. And she and I built that program together. So, um, which, I, is, I, I, which is really awesome. Um, Yes, John, give me one second, I, which is really awesome because, and Chris, you might be able to verify this because over the last few years, the ROP funding has been taken away mm -hmm. and they don't, we don't have that anymore. So building programs like what you just described, that's phenomenal. John, go ahead. Thank you for letting well, me. I had a question. So Jason, you, you, you mentioned that, you know, all these businesses in town, particularly the restaurants didn't, you know, no longer could hand people sandwiches. So what's the solution? I mean, where, what was the, what was the track you, just, you determined was best? What, what, what happened there? So there were lots of suggestions. We talked about a GoFundMe for business owners. We talked about um, trying to stand up a third-party delivery service that would be free so that people could still order food. Um, and then, you know, you hit all the subsequent roadblocks that exist around sort of out-of-the-box thinking. And what we came up with was Lincoln Delivers. It's ideally a a stipend paid back to the business owner to compensate them for delivery fees from DoorDash, which are exorbitant, by the way. They're like 30% of the order actually goes to DoorDash. They throw some shekels at the driver who does all the work, uh, but then the rest of that just stays in, in their margin. So we were able to, and Amanda did a fin, I mean, like an unbelievable job um, coming up with funds. And originally they called us and said, hey, we want to we wanna help somebody hire somebody back who was laid off. And that can be so problematic that we thought this might be a cleaner way to get fast money in the hands of business owners that are struggling uh, and also serve to, you know, get more people food that are nervous about leaving their house. I mean, there are a lot of people in the city here that um, are, are a part of that sensitive community that probably shouldn't be out and about um, mingling with folks that may or may not be wearing masks. It was a, it was a fantastic solution. It, it's been incredibly successful. And I think everybody that's in that particular project feels like this thing really moved the needle. I mean, there are up to $3,000, $4,000 a week being paid out I, to some of I our local that, restaurants to compensate them for delivery fees. If I understand what you're saying, you developed a program to rebate the restaurants the cost of the delivery and therefore also encourage other people to order online to these restaurants? Mm -hmm. We did. And yeah, we started a social media campaign to help people know that if you order, you know, a burrito on DoorDash from this vendor, they're going to get compensated their delivery fees. And that kept them from adding those fees to the price of the meal that they were going to charge uh, the person who's at home just trying to eat their favorite burrito. So it was really kind of a big win. And I like that kind of stuff. I like when you can, where you can sort of connect a few dots and get some synergy. Yeah, that, that was pretty amazing because uh, um, I know Emmaus was the, the biggest donor, but Lincoln Christian Life Center and wasn't they were there one. Wasn't there one other person? Who came uh, I think Lincoln Community Center okay. or wait, uh, Lincoln. Who was that? John, maybe you'll remember. I don't recall the other donor. I think Lincoln Community Foundation was one of them. Yeah. That's it. So you got and, and I think the did the Rotary come in as well? Chris, do you recall? Okay. And so, we're still looking actually yeah. for for continuous revenue streams to keep that program working. But it, it's really benefited the business community, which is amazing. So thank you for the question, John. Holly, okay. Holly we have a question from Nancy, who's oh, um, okay. Okay. Don't see her video, but we can see that she's on her iPhone. Oh, okay. All right, Nancy, go ahead. What's your question? I, I want to go back a little. You mentioned um, the pathways at Lincoln High School and mm -hmm. Mandy Ritalik, who's my hero. I'm glad you like her. 
Um, I really am concerned about when the new high school is opened and how they're going to divide those pathways that have been developed over the last few years and have become very, very strong, as you mentioned, about the biomedical. And mm -hmm. for example, there are freshmen now taking biomedical and it's a four year pathway. And if mm -hmm. they want to continue that, they are going to have to go to the new high school. Although they are very diehard zebra people, generational, and they want to stay at Lincoln High School. I understand that we're going to have open enrollment, so they have a choice of that, but they wouldn't be able to continue that program if they stayed. What's your thought on how they're going to divide those, not just that pathway, but mm -hmm. maybe? So I know that partially the challenge there is the specifics of the classroom space that those pathways are utilizing. So um, there's a, a computer technology pathway uh, and media pathway that both have very specific, uh, you know, like, um, I don't want to call them wings, but there are, you know, classrooms per se designed for those pathways. I worked with Mandy to scope out what the pathway would look like for biomed and that didn't make it into the grant for the new high school's construction. So, um, I, and, and Nancy, I don't, I don't know to what extent um, the classroom sort of requires the student to migrate over, but I think that that will show up as a barrier unless Lincoln High School, you know, is equipped with the same type of, uh, you know, technology and the same sort of room configuration as the new high school. It's just very easy to start with a clean slate and make sure you have the right, you know, specifications, the right space and whatnot. Well, Mandy's teaching the class now, so she obviously has the right configuration and the right equipment to teach it. Right, right. Of course, and the new high school will have new equipment and a new classroom. Correct, but correct. I, I just wonder and what your thought is about having, I mean, would you be able to express an opinion about, do you think that it's okay? I, I, I'm a little concerned about the new high school, when the new high school opens, creating kind of a have and have not kind sure. of situation. Yeah. Well, yeah. Can you address that? Yeah, I'll tell you, he, here's, here's my belief. And again, I, I try not to say, you know, a chicken in every pot because I, I'm, I need to get into the room and find out what the resources are and whatnot. Um, so I'll tell you that I, I personally believe there needs to be fully developed pathways in both schools. We need that kind of throughput to make that kind of an opportunity for that number of children. So that's exactly what my focus will be. It should be in both locations. There should be duplicate programs, and those programs should both be running at speed. Um, to, to the extent in which we can fund those out of the gate, I'm not sure yet, but that's going to be a huge emphasis of mine is vocational preparedness. So absolutely, the CT is the best way to get that done, and I want to see it in both schools for sure. Good. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Did anybody else have a question before I continue with with mine. I, I actually have one more question, I, if you don't mind. Oh, go right ahead. No, not at all. Um, can you speak to, there's been over the years many discussions about having academies out at the farm where um, we're not just teaching ag classes, but um, teaching all classes out there and even having elementary students go out. Can you speak to what your thought is on having academies at the farm and developing that? You kind of touched on it earlier, but mm -hmm. maybe expand on what you feel about the farm. So I'll zoom out a tiny bit and then answer that question more specifically. I think that the way that we've built our educational system is designed to teach people how to work in a factory. Um, herding them from room to room at a bell call and programming them to eat at a specific time every day and grouping them into a specific room to do a specific task is very much factory worker mentality. Um, if you trace back our public school system roots, you'll find that it was really kind of formatted from something they saw in Prussia and then developed by executives in the United States like Rockefeller and Ford. Um, they really wanted to see kids that the top track were going to be executives, the middle track were going to be accountants, and then everybody else was going to kind of dump into that factory environment. And they built our school system in part to help people understand to be able to function within that sort of like from here to here to here to here linear thing. I don't like any of those things. I don't think life is like that. 
I think it's really hard to hire people that think and work that way because they have a very narrow skill set. And I am all for absolutely as much as you can dissolving the lines between topic and actually having somebody who's, let's say, researching history to articulate that in some sort of art that they create with their hands so that we allow students to actually practice what they're reading in the form of what they can create with their fingertips. We are moving into a creative person economy. Data mining, data analysis, data collection, it will all be automated and, and not, not much, it's a lot sooner than you might think. So where we can enable ourselves to leverage that human creativity is where we're gonna give our, our students the best edge as they move into an economy that I think is gonna value creativity and the ability to sort of change with a, with a you know, flexible environment. So to that end, I would tell you absolutely, we should always be looking to put new problems in front of everybody and then step out of the way and let them solve them. So I would even say, why don't we reach out to the high school kids and let's have them start to develop and mentor younger folks in a farm environment so they can expose them to what agriculture is, get them a sense of whether or not they enjoy it, and then we teach the high schoolers how to be leaders or maybe middle schoolers how to be leaders. I really wanna see we mentor the top so they mentor each other all the way down the line so that there's less teacher-centric teaching and more student-centric sort of problem solving. Does that help? And Nancy, if that's not specific enough, hold me to a better answer, but that's, that's, no, no, that's actually what I'm thinking. I, have you been out to the farm? I have. Yeah, as a part of Leadership Lincoln, we take tours out there. I think it's magnificent. Isn't it great? Oh, it's, and it's massive. You don't think it's as big as it is, and it really is. And there's a lot more going on there than just, hey, this is where we plant. I mean, there's a ton of stuff. There's a lot of mechanics. There's a lot of, you know, technology. There's, there's a, a lot of great things going on out there. I think it's such a cool resource, and, and we're, we're lucky to be one of the few districts to have it. Exactly. Isn't it, isn't it the largest working high school farm in the country? Yeah. So yeah. You know, well, west of the Mississippi, I'm told. Yeah. Last year when um, city council went to Washington, D.C. for cap to cap, I got to meet the, um, the undersecretary to the agriculture. And I actually told him that. I told him where I'm from. And I said, hey, I just want you to know. And he's like, wow, that's cool. Good for you. So, yeah. Yeah. Did you, um, did you give him a, a Love Lincoln Shop Local sticker for his didn't uh, that yet. We didn't helicopter that yet. or whatever? I can't, that came after, yeah. I'll, I, and I'll also tell you, Nancy, I would love to see, you know, let's merge technology with agriculture right. in, in drone um, operation, in a blockchain. They're using blockchain now to track where produce and where meat products are, are actually processed before they're shipped out. So if there's ever an outbreak of E. coli, they can quickly trace it back to who owned it. I mean, these, you can really start to, to, to bring kids that would not be those outdoorsy kids out into the, into the world in a way that, again, exposes them to, oh, wow, I thought it would be different than it is. And actually, I didn't think I'd enjoy it, and I really do. But I think there's a lot you can do. Internet of Things is a massive movement right now in technology, and a lot of it's aimed at farming to make it more efficient and all the other things. Right. Maybe I can ask a question of your wife. I'll, I'll yeah, ask, and maybe she could answer it. Um, we're a small town, and sometimes um, we become friends with the people that you are supposed to be their boss if you're on the school board. And I'm just wondering, what is it in your personality that would allow you that if you disagreed adamantly with a decision that a superintendent made, or other board members made for that matter, um, what is your personality that you, would allow you to stand up to them and say, no, I'm not going to rubber stamp this. I, I want to talk about it more or or this is my opinion, I have a descending vote. I'm always open to all ideas and opinions and I'll still stick to my guns, but I'm not gonna shut anybody down with theirs. Is that what he yeah, would say? Oh. I meant, I meant what she would say that you yeah, would Yeah, no, go ahead. Say. This is great. <laughs> is that what she would say? I, I would, I'm, I'm very open to everyone's ideas and their perspectives. Um, and I'm open to some change, but I will still, believe in what I believe in and still uh, stand I think, and what, I think what she's and, asking is, what would Jason do? What is your perspective of how Jason would um, approach that? <laughs> he would you talk to my wife. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, she said he wants to ask his wife how he would oh. do that. Would he stand up? Would he, stand up? he a rubber stamper? That's to you, Ann. No. Um, oh. Yeah. She's asking you 
how Jason would be, your perspective if Jason, is he a rubber stamper or would he stand up and even though he's friends with the board or superintendent, would he fight for his position? She's oh. asking if he would do that. Yeah, 100% he would, he, would, he would stand his ground and fight for what he believes in. He wouldn't just uh, go along with whatever pressure's there. Good. Yeah, and Thank you. Nancy, if, if I can speak for myself, I, I actually, <laughs> I have more right. questions in most cases than I do answers. So I, it, to me, conflict is just, that's the first half of a conversation, right? I mean, then it's, well, hey, let me better understand why it is you feel this way. And, and usually I can, I can kind of get, um, I can get consensus with a group of people if I'm headed the right direction, because I'm pretty articulate. I can, I can find ways to explain things and I, and I don't get um, shaken if a person just outright, you know, tells me I'm completely wrong. I just feel like, okay, well then let's, let's discuss it. But yeah, I'm, I'm not a fan of rubber stamping. I, there's too much at stake here. Like I, this position works for every student that walks on that campus. Right. And, you know, I, I, as I've learned a little bit about our state teachers association, it frustrates me to know that while I'm sure they're great, um, tenure really allows them the opportunity if they choose to take it to be very apathetic. And I'm like, man, I, it's such a massive responsibility to be a teacher. It's incredibly important. And a bad teacher can make a really bad outcome, just like a really good teacher can make a really good outcome. And I feel like they've all got to be good. That's just, that's how I feel. So I will always be trying to make sure that the, that the experience the student gets is the very best it can be. And that's really all I care about. Let me, since you brought up, since you brought up unions, Jason, let me, let me jump ahead one. And um, then I'll go back to my other questions that I had. Um, can you tell us uh, your experience working with unions? And so I, you're going to have to reach out to the, the teachers. Right, now. right. Um, I'm a fan of collective bargaining. I, I think it's, it's great to get consensus on the side of the labor workforce and, and come with the United Front. I think it, it keeps dialogue open. It keeps transparency, which I'm a huge fan of. Um, I have been a, a union member. I have been on, uh, uh, on, on bargaining teams where we've gone out and sort of, you know, done collective bargaining. Um, I, I've sort of seen several different aspects. The research that I've done about this district's relationship with their unions, because there are several, um, is really encouraging. Because to be frank, you know, the state teachers union is incredibly powerful. And if they wanted to, could really kind of be incredibly difficult to deal with. And they are in some districts in California. With, with Western Plaster, I think we're fortunate that Scott and Carrie, hopefully moving forward, um, has a really good relationship with the union. Uh, and, and does a good job early on making sure teachers and certificated folks and classified folks are good fits before they sort of become permanent status. Um, that is about the only real authority that the school district has to look out for um, students is to make sure that before that, that teacher gets permanent status, that any kind of remediation or even dismissal occurs then. Um, I, I've asked some very specific questions about, you know, I, I'm reading the contract. The contract talks about teacher monitoring, but it doesn't talk about teacher discipline. Um, and a lot of that's written in ed code and it's very specific about how you interact with a teacher. So I'm, I'm comfortable with that, but more than anything, I'm just glad that there's a collaborative working environment. You know, we, our district did a town hall and it was our superintendent and the, uh, the president of the union. And, and I don't know what other district you're gonna see I mean, Holly, was, was, was that in, in, did that happen in your district or was the superintendent and the, and the head of the bargaining unit both sort of talking about, hey, we're anxious to get back in the classroom? Do you have that same sort of, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, but that same sort of, that tight knit, you know, collaborative uh, relationship. Yeah, they, they work together, but it, but we don't usually have like town hall like that. Yeah, it's not, it's not like that, so. So we're, I think we're unique and I think that that's definitely something in our favor it shows that we've done right by teachers in the past that they sort of keep the state union um, out of most of the conversations and that stuff is held, uh, handled locally. So I'm, I'm excited about the fact that the relationship is good and I think it's important to keep that relationship moving forward. Um, can, you kind of already touched on it a little bit, but can, can you tell us um, anything else specifically that you have learned about the district, the staff, and the stakeholders during this campaign? Because I know that you have made a lot of phone calls, you have done a lot of research. What, what else can you share with us that maybe you can say that you have learned about 
all of the stakeholders in our district through this uh, process? Well, you know, um, I've, I've spoken to most of it, but um, I think the relationship that the district has with its staff, um, with the students, the throughput of students that we're seeing leave our school district and move on to college and good jobs, all of our numbers are really good. We were given the exemplary district, I believe it was uh, in 2019 um, or maybe it's 2018, and that's really rare. It's over a thousand districts that are sort of in queue for that kind of an award. Um, I think Scott Lehman's done a great job. Um, I've talked to, I was, I was literally on a, um, on a search to find somebody that didn't like him because everybody says great things about him. Like this, somebody has to hate this guy. I got to find the person that's just like, Oh, let me tell you, you know, and, and I literally could not find anyone, even people that were like, well, there, you know, we've, we've, you know, we've tangled a few times, but he really is a great guy and he really does love this, this district. And I think it's incredibly rare to see a district name a school after a sitting superintendent. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I feel like um, it's, it's a great culture to be joining. Um, I think I'm the right person to mix in with the other board members as well, because I bring a talent that, that I don't know that they currently possess. I'm, I'm, I think I'm a lot more, um, you know, idea driven and I'm a lot more, you know, concerned about how we're preparing uh, kids for the workforce. Not to say they're not, but that's a huge focus of mine. And, and I think I'm going to make the meetings run long, and I don't think I'm going to have a ton of friends after about the first year. But honestly, I, I think that this is a really important place for us to be spending a lot of time. Good. Good. Um, so I'm sure this is a question that's on everybody's mind uh, because uh, Lincoln's actually getting ready to go back to school. So what what's the what's the district's plan to get kids back in the classroom? you know, with all of the mitigating factors for COVID and do you agree with it? Would you do something different? Are you on board with what the plan is right now? So the, the district's plan as of next week is to start in-person session uh, on a five-day program, which means Monday through Friday, these kids are going to school. Um, they have made provisions, about 30% of the parents have opted to keep their kids in distance. Um, and they'll have an opportunity to sort of re-up that commitment, um, you know, in the next semester. But as of right now, the folks that have voluntarily stayed home um, have sort of made the classroom uh, now large enough for them to socially distance while in class. And another, like, and this blows my mind because, again, I've, I've done distance teaching as, as an instructor. I've actually taught EMT classes uh, through a computer, and it's, it's really hard to do. And our teachers are have committed to do a five-day program with students in the classroom, but while they're simultaneously teaching that same group of students uh, online. Mm -hmm. um, so that means that they're going to allow students uh, via webcam to interact with the rest of the class in real time, rather than breaking those students up into two segments. And I think that's really important for a couple of reasons. The first is it gives parents options. And this thing is scary. Okay, I am a paramedic. Um, I think that the numbers aren't as scary as the disease in the one in a thousand that it really, really affects. And people should be afraid. Um, to a certain extent, if you get this and the outcome is poor, um, I, I have lots of friends in medicine that are like, this, this thing is bad. Um, and statistically, uh, it's safe if you, if you approach that with the right personal protective equipment, social distancing and masks, and all of the students and all of the teachers have agreed that that's going to be a part of the, the, the district has spent millions of dollars and I'm not kidding millions of dollars preparing schools for that to be a safe place. The five day option with simulcast of web really allows if a student is in contact with maybe somebody at home who tests positive or like the day test positive, they if they're asymptomatic can stay home and just join those that are online until their quarantine period is done and they're safe to come back and they can go right back into the classroom. Um, that's not easy to do. I can't imagine uh, how, how hard that was to get all the administrators and teachers on, on board with that plan because it's really asking a lot of a teacher to do, but that's the plan. And it's really, uh, I think it allows for a lot of, hey, if this happens, how do we react? And so there's a lot of flexibility in a plan like that. Um, I, I, th I absolutely support it. I think we do have to get our kids back into classrooms. And, and if we can do it safely, we need to do it right away. So I just, I just have one more question for you. Um, 
And then, you know, we can spend another couple minutes if anybody that's joining us has a question um, before we wrap it up. But um, so you've already shared a lot of your ideas and a lot of your vision for what you would like to see happen. Um, but is there anything else that we haven't talked about that if you get elected, that you uh, that you intend to do that you have in your heart and your mind like if I get elected then this is something that I intend to do or try to get accomplished is there anything else that you haven't already shared with us well there's there's a couple of things that I've spoken to this before that are my areas of focus and one I think we've covered technology is really important to me and I think it needs to be really important to the district um, the other is mentorship we have an unbelievable network of business people and government leaders and nonprofits and volunteers and a, a thousand other types of categories of people that have the time and the wisdom to share with a young person who's starting to plot their life. Um, I think right now it really feels like we put kids in the silo of education and we tell them, look, go to school, graduate, then go to college. And when you're done, it's like we just turn the lights on and go, okay, now go, you're an adult, hurry up hurry up, you're already behind and, you know, get a job now and where are you going to live? And I, I, I feel it in my own kids. They, it's, this, it's like the shock of cold water when school, their school life ends and their real life begins. And I think we could do a better job as a community to mentor and coach young people. Like take somebody under your wing and say, look, hey, have you thought about, uh, you know, the, where you want to live? Um, have you thought about, you know, how much, how much money it's going to take for you to buy the house you want and have you looked at any other place in california or have you thought about doing a job in dental hygiene you know you have longer weekends and sometimes these little seeds in a kid's mind they go oh i mean how how often do kids like leave high school and like, i'm going to be a teacher because that's who they've seen their whole life they've only met teachers and parents you know what i mean let's get them out of that mold let's get them out to somebody who owns a franchise and learn about what that looks like and, and get them into some internships where they have an opportunity to solve a problem, put them into, you know, one of my focuses is to, is to grab a high school student every year. And, and I want to sponsor them through the leadership Lincoln. I want them to meet our mayor and our police chief and our fire chief, even though it's the same person. And, and I want them to meet local, you know, business leaders. Like I want them to see that, you know, grownups are really just tall children for the most part. I mean, yeah, we've learned a bunch of stuff and we've, you know, we've got some scars along the way. But there's a scariness to growing up that I think we could diffuse if we just got our kids into that working environment and gave them, you know, a group of, of people that are there to prop them up and hold them accountable. You know, like that's, I think, something that Lincoln is built for. I mean, we are really good at locking arms. You know, I mean, we just we just really are. And I want to I want to ask that of our of our local business leaders. I want to ask that of our retired community, you know, have coffee with a kid. Talk to them about hey, listen, you know, what are your thoughts on season one and season two of your life? And where do you think you want to, and have some real conversations. Let them, let them grow a network of people they can call with questions. And I think that's absolutely essential. That's something I'm going to personally take on as a task to start building that network of mentors and coaches. And I'm going to ask some of my friends and colleagues to, to do their part. You can sign me up as a mentor. I actually love it. I will. I think it's amazing. Um, and uh, I always say that that nobody comes together like, and uh, I think this mentor a thing is, I mean, it's, it's a great idea. I'm, and, you know, we should have been doing it for a long time, but, and that's no criticism. It's just, it's a great, it's a great idea. So, um, so those are all the questions that I have. Does anybody else have a question that you would like to ask Jason before we end tonight? Oh my gosh, you guys are like my kids on Zoom. Okay, unmute yourself and talk to me. <laughs> Somebody raised their hand. Do you see that, Janet, or no? Oh, you're muted. That was me. Nancy, did you have another question? No. Oh, was that, a, was no, that, that an old was, hand raised? That's an old hand. <laughs> okay. It's an old hand. Well, this was fun, Holly. I, I appreciate this. And I appreciate you taking time to do it. I. I really do, you know, especially your perspective as a teacher, like, I, I feel like there's still a lot that I need to learn and understand about sort of the nuances of being effective in a role like this. And that's, I, I wanted you to do this because I knew you weren't going to pull punches and you were going to definitely give me the, you know, the, the, the hard questions. Well, it's my pleasure. And I think, I think your approach to working with the staff and, uh, you know, all of the issues that come up between the teachers and 
and the and the district and the board and all that is I think you have a good perspective I, I would just give you one piece of advice which Please. I think you already know this that that it's not an us versus them you know the, the board and the superintendent and the district office officials need to know that they can trust their teachers to be professionals and that um, we're working our guts out every day to reach oh, yeah. kids. and it's not an us versus them but I think you are right that when administrators do their job when new teachers come in if they're not a fit if they're not doing their job get rid of them before they become a problem you know i hear people all the time saying oh you can never get rid of bad teachers tenure this and that and i'm like well tenure is there for a reason um but if administrators and the school board does their job then we can weed out those bad teachers before they become tenured and that's part of the process so yeah that is important but the you know the bad teachers are few and far between for the most part uh it's really about the teachers knowing that you got their back that that they have your back and that you work together as a team and it's not it's never should be us versus them um and of course you may not always agree right and when you have negotiations and there's issues that go on you have to come to some kind of middle ground um but uh it's important that the teachers and the staff understand or feel like the board cares about them and i want to i want to say that too because i i've watched company. In fact, I have a company right now that I'm working with and they're going to try and transition from one meeting technology to another. 200 staff, they're spread across seven different buildings and they do, you know, advanced plastic modification. And I'm talking to their director of, of IT about how we're going to migrate them from here to here. And he wants to, in segments of 10, notify them, this is your new application. The new application is very much like the old one, except it has a new username and a new password. And he's talking about a three-month strategy to transition these knowledge workers from this technology to that technology. And back in March, we told every teacher without any plan or any warning that they now have to teach 100% of what they were doing in front of students mm -hmm. online. We gave them no notice, we barely trained them, and we said, go and figure it out. Um, and, and they did it, and you guys did it. And I don't know how. Um, so if, if you don't hear an overwhelming sense of gratitude um, then that I've done something wrong because I'm in awe of the fact that teachers wake up in the morning and take this thing on. It's incredibly difficult and I'm not saying that right. in jest. In fact, after this, I was, I was just talking to Chris Wyatt the other day and I was like, I think what we need to do is, let's say you have a teacher who's, I'm, I, my fear is, is teacher apathy. You do the same thing over and over and over and over again until you're great at it. You're 17 years in now and you're like, I mean, how do we motivate you? So one of the things that we were chatting about was what if we took our media department inside the high schools in both of those CTE tracks, we connected them in a way that that person reminds this student who graduated five years ago that their favorite teacher is celebrating their 10 year anniversary. Is there something you'd like to say for them digitally or in writing that we could use to hand that? I mean, how empowering would it be for a teacher to on their five year anniversary or 10 year anniversary to get this incredible document with all of these little pictures and comments from wow. students that they've had in previous classes. Like, I definitely wanna make sure that teachers that do amazing jobs, they, they feel it. And then the teachers that are kind of doing a mediocre job want that. Right. And I think we can, we can help them bridge the gap. We can get them motivated again if we just celebrated the fact that, you know, they're, they're working really hard at it. So I, I absolutely think we're all in this together for sure. Good. Awesome. Well, that, thank you everybody for joining us. I, I hope that you learned something about Jason and um, I know I'm going to be voting for him. I hope you do too. So. Yeah. Of course. Thank Me you. Too. Thank you everybody for doing this. I appreciate you sharing some of your Thursday with me. It's Thursday. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Good job. Nothing messes up your Friday worse than Friday. No. That's only Tuesday. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> I got to get to bed. <laughs> yeah, nothing messes up your Friday more than finding out it's only Tuesday. <laughs> yeah, for sure. All right. Thank, thank you, Jason. Everybody. Thanks, all. Thank you. Bye -bye. Appreciate it. Vote for us in November. Always. Always, several times. <laughs> <laughs>